GS-467. This old-time radio program was originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. We hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to this, one of the all-time favorite shows. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. Near the end of October, business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crosley service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radios. Not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We take you now to the Mer Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. With a touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Campesita. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York. that never loses favor. The ever-popular Stardust, Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. 
Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with a noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on this event. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. now to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. I'm standing in a large semicircular room, pitch black except for an oblong split in the ceiling. Through this opening, I can see a sprinkling of stars that cast a kind of frosty glow over the intricate mechanism of the huge telescope. The ticking sound you hear is the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through the giant lens. I'll ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise during our interview. Besides the ceaseless watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or other communications. During this period, he is in constant touch with the astronomical centers of the world. Professor, may I begin our questions? Uh, any time, Mr. Phillips. Professor. Would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A red disk swimming in a blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disk. Quite distinct now, because Mars happens to be at the point nearest the Earth, in opposition, as we call it. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, Professor Pearson? Huh. Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips. They Although, that's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to the planet. Then, you're quite convinced, as a scientist, that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars? I should say the chances against it are a thousand to one. And yet, how do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Phillips, I cannot account for it. Oh, by the way, Professor, for the benefit of our listeners, how far is Mars from the Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. <laughs> well, that seems a safe enough distance. Uh, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has just handed Professor Pearson a message. While he reads it, let me remind you that we, we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer, Professor Pearson. Oh, one moment, please. Professor Pearson has passed me a message which he has just received. Uh, Professor, may I read the message to the listening audience? Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you a wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray of the Natural History Museum, New York. Quote, 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Seismograph registered shock of almost earthquake intensity occurring within a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate. Signed, Lloyd Gray, Chief of Astronomical Division. Unquote. Professor Pearson, could this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? Well, hardly, Mr. Phillips. This is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past ten minutes, we've been speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton, bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York studio. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News, Toronto, Canada. Professor Morris of Macmillan University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. 
Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millett and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin. Paint for you a word picture of a strange scene before my eyes, but nothing out of a modern Arabian night. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. I... Yes, that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. Half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree. It must have struck on its way down. But I can see the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of, um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, uh, what's the diameter of this? About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheath is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish white. It's curious spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. They're uh, getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, 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 would you mind standing one side, please? While the police are pushing the crowd back. Here's Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmot. Uh, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that oh, dropped in your backyard? Uh, uh, step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmot. Well, I was listening uh, to the radio. Uh, closer and louder, please. Pardon me? Uh, louder, please, closer. Yes. <clears throat> I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsy. That professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half chosen and half... Yes, yes, Mr. Wilmot, and uh, then what happened? Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio kind of halfway. Yes, Mr. Wilmot. And then you saw something. Well, not first off. I heard something. And what did you hear? A uh, hissing sound like this. Uh, kind of like a 4th of July rocket. Yes, then what? I turned my head out the window and would have sworn I was asleep and dreaming. Yes. I seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmot? Well, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I was kind of riled. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilmot. Thank you very much. Yeah, you want me to tell No, that's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm, where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us, and the police are trying to rope off the roadway leading into the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. The car's headlights throw an enormous spotlight on the pit where the objects have buried. Now, some of the more daring souls now are venturing near the edge. Yeah, the silhouettes stand out against the metal sheet. <laughs> One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with a policeman. Now, the policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. Here. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson? Yes, of course. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? What do you think? The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. Friction with the earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and you can see a cylindrical oh, shape. Minute. Something's happening. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. 
top is beginning to rotate like a screw and this thing must be hollow. He's moving! Keep those men back! Keep those idiots back! Come on, Mr. Well, take off! The top blew! Go, Sam! Stand back! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone's calling someone or something. I can see turning out of that black hole two luminous disks. The eyes, it might be a face, might be almost oh, 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 oh. heavens. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another one and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body. Now it's large, it's large as a bear. It's glistens like wet leather, but it's a face. It's, it's Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable, but I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is a kind of V-shape with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to oh, it's quiver and pulsate and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now and the crowd falls back. It seems plenty. The most extraordinary experience, ladies and gentlemen, I can't find words. And, well, I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description until I can... Take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. 